As I told you, the first verse that we have here has to be well understood because it cannot be that you say, okay, I want to be a wise person, so let me just, what, not have any emotions no matter what happens in my life. <laughs> because a wise person has no grief, so let me kind of, you know, be the same, right? So that will uh, make you only suppress your emotions and not be the wise person. So the wise person is uh, looking at the whole situation at a different level. So that's why uh, there is no grief, right? So what is the vision of the wise person? Lord Krishna explains about the, what is, as we saw, the nature of Atma. Next. Rajayati Mriyate Vakadachita Nayam bhutva bhavita vana bhuyaha Ajo nitya shashvato yam puranaha Nahanyate hanyamane sharire So the wise person uh, understands what Atma, what is the nature of Atma? Atma, what is Atma? I. Sanskrit meaning of the word I am is Atma. Now, here the wise people understand that Atma na hanyate hanyamane sharire. When the body dies, Atma does not die. So that means generally we make no distinction between I and the body. Whereas the wise person seems to make a distinction between what I and the body. So therefore, we have to understand first, why am I not the body, right? Because the wise person don't see that the Atma dies when the body dies. So therefore, this body, we have to understand uh, what is the nature of this body and what is my relationship with the body. If I begin to ask myself a question, what is this body? Then, what is the body? Tell me. The body is nothing but different parts which are put together. Right? What are the different parts which are put together? It depends upon what you call a part. <laughs> right? So either if you can take different organs as part, then body is nothing but what? Assemblage of different organs which are put together. Right? Liver, kidney, lungs, all these are different uh, intestines. These are all the different uh, organs of your body and when they, they are put together, you give it a name called body. Now, these organs that are put together, they themselves are made up of parts. Right? So that means uh, that uh, the liver itself has what what all is there in the liver? liver you know? <laughs> Ultimately, you can say there are all cells. So that means the cells combine together to make an organ called liver. So that means the part that we are talking about is actually not even a liver, it is what? Cells. And kidney is also nothing but cells. And all the different organs of the body are also nothing but cells. So that means, if I want to know the relationship that I have with the body, I need to ask myself, 
what is my relationship with the cells? Am I the cells or the cells come and go and I'm present? You need to ask yourself that question because those parts actually consist of nothing but cells. So, if anybody knows a little bit of, there are medical doctors here and they all know very well that all the cells of your body that you were born with, are they with you right now? Are they there? None of them. None of them are with you. In fact, every 12 years, none of the cell. So from today, whatever cell you have, 12 years from now, none of those cells that you have today will exist 12 years from now. This and you will be there or not? Hopefully. <laughs> so that means it tells you something very important about the relationship you have with the body. Because generally for us, I am as good as the body. Not only I think I am as good as the body, but because of this identity, I have so many different complexes about my self-image. I make the mistake when I take body to be I, whereas body is nothing but cells, and cells come and go. In fact, today itself, you could have shedded some cells. And today itself, there could have been some new cells which are regenerated. Not regenerated, new ones that you didn't have before. So that means the cells come and go, but who are you? If you were the cell, then what will happen? Every time the cell goes, you should disappear. And every time the cell comes, you will re reappear. Is it true? No. It is very clear to us that cells come and go and I am present. So that means this body is nothing but some billions of cells working together. And the same cells, when they combine in a certain permutation and combination, they become what? Liver then they become kidney, then they become different organs of the body. And they are constantly undergoing change and they are what? The old ones go, new ones come and you always remain. So therefore, there is a distinction between I and the body. Now, when you give up this, when you correct that mistake and if you say that actually, uh, it's more accurate to say that I have a body. True. It's correct. I have the body means among all the different bodies that I see, I do have a special relationship with one body. True. That's why only I can have my back aches. No matter how much uh, uh, Utah tries to correct my posture, do whatever. <laughs> Right? And my Alexander technique and all kinds of things, right? But only I'm stuck with what I have in this physical body. So that means among all the different bodies that exist, I have a special relationship with one body. True. Absolutely correct. Like among all the different houses, I do have a special relationship with one house. Among all the different cars, I have a special relationship with whichever car you have. Correct. But because you have a special relationship with one house or one car, do you say, I am the car? <laughs> no. That is the mistake that we make. I do have a special relationship with one body, but in the... Uh, in my understanding, there is no difference between what body and I, which is Atma. 
what Lord Krishna says is, A, there is a difference. The body is nothing but cells. They come and go and you don't come and go with the coming and going of different cells of the body. Now, when we make this mistake and we take ourselves to be the body, this mistake that we make has a cost. What is the cost for this mistake? You become as small as the body. What is the position of this body in this universe? If you have a map of the universe and if you have to place your body in it, how much space will it occupy? Very little. And you become that small with this mistake. And not only you become small, but what happens is when you open your eyes and you look around other people, <coughs> they seem to have what sometimes in your vision better bodies. <laughs> Then the problem even multiplies further. Not only you are insignificant, but others are better than you. So that means your self-image gets even worse. Then not only others are beautiful, but you begin to have what? Back aches. When you have a head, Swamiji used to, our teacher used to say, you are sure to have a headache one time or the other. So that means all the afflictions of the body become what? The afflictions of I. Then, uh, uh, this body is programmed in a way that it will decline it can never remain 16 year old, always. So when you become 42 years old, when you become 46 years old, then what? All the anxiety starts. How to not have wrinkles? <laughs> what to do with my grey hair? How to look young and beautiful? So that means the insecurities start. With one mistake that you make, what is the cost of this mistake? And then, not only all of that, but then you become mortal. They say, among all the fears, the greatest fear people have is what? about mortality. People can't handle that the people you love are going to disappear one day. And you also can't handle what? That I'm going to disappear one day. So that means with this one mistake about what exactly the relationship I have with the body and if I make one mistake I'm, I'm stuck with series of problems of not only my self-identity, my self-image and everything else and how I feel about myself. So this is why it is, there is no avoidance of suffering with this mistake that we make. This is what Lord Krishna was telling Arjuna. That wise people, they have freed themselves from suffering because they understand very well the relationship they have with the body. Because if you do make a mistake, suffering is inevitable. So therefore, uh, this is what he says, Na hanyate 
अन्यमाने शरीर आत्मा doesn't get destroyed when the body gets destroyed <coughs> then uh, uh, what are the different conditions of the body na jayate briyate the body is born and then the body dies so uh, uh, the atma is something which doesn't is not born and does not die there was never a time that it was not and there was never a time it will not be so this again we need to understand <coughs> what is the nature of atma in addition to the body where is your sense of i so many of us we make statements very commonly make statements i am really happy i am sad i am jealous i feel great all these statements that you make about the nature of i where is your i Subtle body is a little bit more sophisticated language because it's a little Vedanta. But mind is, let's take mind as of now. Then we'll go to subtle body and what it means. So that means our sense of I is in addition to with the body. It is also in the mind. That means, again, it's the same relationship. It's different to say, I have the mind. It is true. Why? Because among all the different minds, I have particular relationship with only one mind, which is my mind. Right? So that means only I feel, say for example, two, one situation can happen externally and both of us are witnessing that situation. And both of us can have what? different interpretation of what is going on and as a result of our interpretation we can have what totally different emotions connected to it this is a fact so that means i have a special relationship with one mind and she has special relationship with her mind correct but the mistake that we make is i am the mind. I have the mind is a different sentence than I am the mind. I have the body is a different sentence than I am the body. So that means I have to again see what is the relationship that I have with the mind. Am I the mind or I have the mind? I have a mind through which I experience things. Yeah, it's correct. So now, uh, what is mind? If you really think of what the mind is, it's nothing but series of thoughts. Series of thoughts, you know, right from your childhood till now, how many different thoughts have you had? If I ask you, just tell me how many thoughts you've had from the time. If you are the mind and you are there right now, you should be able to answer this question. And how many thoughts you'll have tomorrow? Nobody can answer that question. Why nobody can answer that question? If there was no difference between I and the thought, then every thought that you have thought of will be stuck to you because you are there right now or not? Are you there? Yes. If there was no distinction between I and the thought, whatever you have thought of till now should be sticking to you. But in fact, we struggle even to know what did I think this morning. Forget from the birth. If I ask you to say, okay, just write down, note down, what, what all did you think from the morning? Even that seems like an impossible task. 
Then if I say, okay, that one day is too much, just last one hour, just only like that. Even that seems impossible. So that means, what does it show? It shows something very important. It shows that I am there and the thoughts come and go. None of the thoughts that I think about, they stick to me. Because if they stick to me, then I should right now be stuck with all the thoughts that I ever thought about. So, there is a relationship that I have with thoughts. Before the thought comes, am I there or not? I am present. Why the thought is there, are you there or not? Once the thought goes, are you there or not? Yes. Then the next thought comes, are you there or not? Yes. It shows me two very important things about my relationship with the thought. One, the thoughts come and go and I am present, coming to know the presence and absence of thoughts. Second, whichever the thought is, no matter what is the quality of that thought, it doesn't stick to me. Second, very important thing. In the um, um, there is a nice in Taittiriya Upanishad Bhashyam, the, the, the Bhashyam commentary. commentary. The commentary of Taittiriya Upanishad, Adi Shankaracharya, the, the author from whom all, this is Adi Shankaracharya, in who, whose commentaries we follow. He gives us an exercise to see what uh, our relationship with the thought is. He says, okay, think of a tree. Then what happens? You think of a tree. Then he says, you think of a cow. What happens? The tree, does it remain? No. It gets totally replaced by what? Cow. Then he says, you think of a horse. What happens? The, the cow is totally gone and a horse if what you thought of became I, what would have happened? You would have become tree. <laughs> and then when you think of a cow, what will happen? The tree will remain and cow will be superimposed on that. Then when you think of a horse, tree, cow and horse all will be stuck together. Is this how it is? Right now, the I am is completely free from anything that you have thought of. Anything that you have thought of. So therefore, uh, two things. I am distinct from the thoughts. Thoughts come and go. I remain. And secondly, whatever is the content of the thought doesn't stick. This is highly, if you really think about it, it is so liberating. <laughs> it is so liberating because all our suffering is in form of what? I am sad, I am this, I am that. You load on your eye with some millions of things. And then suffer for something which doesn't deserve to be suffering. Because there is a mix-up. This suffering is because of mix-up. Of your identity of who you are and what's your relationship with the body and the mind.
the, the mind, even though it is nothing but series of thoughts, it has a certain very sophisticated patterns. It's not just random thoughts which are just kind of floating around, cow, tree, uh, horse. We don't think like that, right? What generally happens is, in our life, our thoughts are very well organized. How are they organized? The external situation occurs. Let's say the external situation is, you see this beautiful rose, beautiful rose for let's see this, beautiful. This rose, this rose, beautiful. All the roses, beautiful. Now, not only you see the rose, it evokes what some emotions in you. Nobody is just like, oh yeah, this is orange, this is red. Are we like robotic? The minute somebody gives you a rose, what happens? It evokes, what does it show you? The act is of giving the rose, but what do you understand by this act? Tell me. That somebody is a well-wisher, somebody is my friend, somebody loves me, somebody thinks well of me, right? Or not. So? Or not <laughs> because I don't like roses. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah, if, if, you, if you may think that, okay, I don't like roses and this enemy has come and given me roses to give me a hard time, <laughs> that also could be, right? So it depends. It, it, it's actually good, wonderful. So that means that that rose, depending on whether I like it or not, it will evoke what some emotion in you. So that is also in form of a thought. And that thought, for how long does it last? How long does it stick? Oh, I love this. Oh, it's beautiful. Or oh, the person may love it. Oh, I hate it. Whatever the thought is, how long does it stay for seconds? Right? So that means there is one given type of uh, function of the mind where the act happens, it creates what? An emotion. There is a corresponding emotion. And sometimes what can happen is we can build on that emotion. Not only I'm pleased, I create a story. What is the story that I can create? That, oh, this person must like me. That is one additional added thing. Another thought. Oh, that was so sweet, right? Third thought. So that means... These are all different, different, different thoughts. They all evoke certain emotions, but they each thought lasts only for a fraction of a second. The experience of feeling good may last for, let's say, 10 minutes because I create series of thoughts related to that thought. That's why there is as though a continuity and as though feelings which last for much longer than a few seconds. But the reality is each thought comes and goes. And the duration of each thought is fraction of seconds. Then you can say, oh, if the, the thoughts remain only for a fraction of second, why do people say, I'm depressed for last year? Why do people say, I'm depressed for last year? Because what happens is this story of whether this is not good, that is not good, it keeps going. Situations keep changing, but one story remains. And that is what, life is not good series of thoughts. This is how 
we get completely connected with what the mistake that we make. And not only we get connected with the mistake that we make that causes suffering. So this is what we call emotions. One way that the mind works. There is a second function of the mind and that is what? Your cognitive capacity. What is your cognitive capacity? That means, it means intellect. Intellect, what it means is, starting from grade 1 till now, whatever you have studied, right? Everything, first when you were in first standard, algebra was too far away. Even simple addition was a struggle. Then as you go to second standard, addition becomes easier and then division becomes difficult. So this is way. What happens is, as you grow, your cognitive capacities begin to what? Develop. This is what we call intellect. <coughs> That means your ability to understand ideas, what is taught to you accurately. All this is something that requires thinking. Please understand. You never understand things without thinking. When is it that somebody says, who is considered intelligent? The person who can understand ideas accurately. So, for example, everybody knows how difficult math is, right? The teacher is teaching mathematics and then at the end of the uh, term, you have an exam. And in that exam, the teacher asks you a little tricky question. The tricky question is asked in order to understand, the teacher has taught, did you understand it or not? So this is where the, your ability to answer that question will decide what, how, because when the teacher is talking about something, that how do you understand? You create corresponding thoughts in your mind. Please understand how you understand things. And when those thoughts are accurate, when they receive the, 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 the thoughts capture what the teacher wanted to say that is called what? The person is intelligent. If your thoughts create the something other than what the teacher is talking about then what? Your cognitive capacities are not so good. So that is even your intelligence is nothing but the result of the thoughts. But there are different type of thoughts than emotions, cognitive capacity. In Sanskrit, the emotions are called manas. The intellect is called buddhi. Then you have one more faculty of thoughts and that is called chitta. What is chitta? Memory. In fact, both your building stories based on one emotion leading to a very happy state of being that requires what? Memory. You build one thought on the other and you create a big picture. Even your cognitive capacity requires memory because imagine in the first grade you learn simple addition and you forget. Can you ever learn algebra? You need memory. Memory is what? Building on things. Which enables you to build on things. So this is why there is one more type of thoughts that we have and that is called memory. Memory is always about the past. Something which has already taken place. 
the future thoughts are called what? Future projections or future imagination or planning or whatever. They have different names. But your memory is required for you to even do the planning for the future. So therefore, memory is one more function. And memory is also in form of thoughts. They are thought frames. When I was 10 years old, I used to love and go and play in the snow. Thought. Oh, yesterday I had really nice dinner. Thought. Memory. Oh, this morning I got late at work. Thought. Memory. So that means the memory is the thoughts relating to the past and you have the capacity to retrieve those thoughts and then what? Either recount it or what? Build on it. So the, these are the functions of the mind. Manas, buddhi and memory is called chitta. They are all nothing but thoughts but they have all these very amazing functions. And the fourth is, in Sanskrit, we call it Ahankara. The Ahankara does not mean, the literal meaning of Ahankara is the sense of I. Aham is I, but Kara is that it gives you a sense of I. What does it mean? It means that as the uh, as you see the situations and it is evoking some emotions as you go to school and you begin to understand things by creating corresponding thoughts as you begin to retrieve the, uh, uh, the your uh, the past info which is stored in your memory what happens is all these three functions get attributed to i what does it mean it means, let's say, some event creates love in you. Then, you don't just say that there is a feeling of love. You say, I love it. So that means, uh, what? There is this I sense which gets connected to what? That feeling of love that you feel. There is a connection which makes you make the statement, I feel love. Now, when your cognitive capacity is able to uh, what, make you understand things accurately, not only you say, yeah, it's true, 2 plus 2 is equal to 4, there is a sense in you which tells you, I am intelligent. Your I am got connected to what? Your intellect. In the previous case, it got connected to what? Your emotions. So your eye sense gets connected to the emotions. Your eye sense gets connected to your cognitive capacity. Your eye sense gets connected to the memory. Memory is just a frame and you can retrieve the frame but you make the statement, when I was five years old, I used to love cookies. So that means now all the other three thoughts are what? Coming and going. Emotions come and go. Your understanding of things you have to understand when you are at work, when you are in school. That, that or you have to make decision. That faculty you use your memory you use, but no matter which faculty you use, one entity always gets connected and that is what? Your I. This is why even though the thoughts are so many, it seems as though there is only one entity which is what going through all of this. So therefore, we all live with 
this connection of these different thoughts to this I sense. This is biological. Nobody can erase it. Even a wise person cannot erase it. These four different types of thoughts the, hu the human brain is made up of. But what wise person can do is to understand that even this I sense, what is my relationship with this I sense? In fact, my I sense is so contradictory. One day I think I am on the top of the world. Next day I think I am down under. If this was the true nature of I, you will be what? Stuck with it. One day you think I love myself, next day you think I hate myself. One day you think you are great, next day you think you are nobody. What does it say about the true nature of I? If you were basically uh, uh, what? One thing, you can't be the other. It tells you something very, very important that your sense of I keeps getting connected with different, different functions of the mind and keeps getting connected with different, different events that take place and it keeps changing. And if any one thing was your true nature, you will be stuck with it forever. But how many times your sense of I undergo changes? And they are all opposite in nature. So, simple logic. If sugar is sugar, it will always stay as sugar, right? If the intrinsic nature of sugar is sweetness, it should always remain what? Sweet. Can it become salty? No. So if you are one way, you should always remain that. You can't be any other way. But your thoughts about yourself are what? One day I am good, next day I am not good. What does it tell you? Logically, what does it say? That you are free from both. <coughs> your opinions and your I sense keeps getting connected with different things and keep creating different stories and different stories and different stories. But if you are intrinsically one thing, you will be stuck with it forever. The very fact that all these stories come and go, it shows that it is not your intrinsic nature. Intrinsic nature by definition means that you will be always with it. Your opinion about I am, how many times it has changed? Tell me. <laughs> Your opinion about I am has changed millions of times. That shows you are none of them. Because if any one of them was your intrinsic nature, you will be stuck with it. I am a lot at the same time. Sorry? If you say the other I, alternative is uh, you I, are am, all, I am a lot of things at the same time. So that means uh, you are happiness and sadness. So that yes, means 
so that means at the same time it is uh, what you can't have you can't say sugar is sugar and salty at the same time sugar not but something else maybe <laughs> okay think about it whatever is the intrinsic nature definition of intrinsic nature is that you can't get rid of it so if you were both at the same time then all the time you should be feeling both at the same time do you understand that mm. if that was your intrinsic nature mm. so right now at every in every situation if both happiness and sadness was your intrinsic nature in every situation you will feel what both happiness and sadness at the same time because that's your nature you are stuck with it or all the things every emotion that you have thought of is just stuck to you if you are all at the same time if it is your intrinsic nature so now what it means is that they come and go all the emotions uh, come and go your cognitive capacities come and go your memories come and go your eye sense also what connected to each three of the functions comes and goes and therefore you are also not then the next question is who are you that because anything that you thought you were which is very intimately body and different conditions of the mind which are imputed on i that is the only definition you had about yourself logically see what vedanta says it shows you logically how it is and you have no logic to disprove what vedanta says or what gita says so now everything that you thought you are not the the now the question is then who are you so lord krishna says what na jayate priyate va kadachit atma is not the one which is born and dead when the body and mind comes and goes is born and dead there is never a time na bhavita va na bhuya ajaha nitya shashvatah and purada this is all atma so now what is this atma what vedanta says or what gita says is that the understand the different conditions of the body from the time of your birth till now every day your body underwent a change every day your mind had hundreds of thoughts they are all changing and in order for you to know the changes coming and going of things you have to be what constant and not only you have to be constant you have to know the coming and going of things which requires what one thing it requires without which the changing condition of the body changing conditions of the mind changing conditions of the external world cannot be known what is that one thing which is required without which nothing can be known and that is what vedanta says is chit avat there is awareness 
which is independent of what all the changes that are taking place. Chit Swarupa. That awareness without which neither the body can be, the changing conditions of the body cannot be known. The changing conditions of the mind cannot be known. And the changing conditions and the changing conditions of memory cannot be known. The changing conditions of your eye sense cannot be known. So that is what we call awareness. So what is, I will do today then I will continue tomorrow. What is the relationship of awareness with thoughts? I can show you with an example. Let's say there is this clear glass. Now, if I put an object which is orange, the, the glass seems like what? That's not orange. Pink. 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 Sorry. Pink. Pink. The glass seems like pink. Then if I move the, uh, the pink uh, uh, watch and if I put orange cup, what does this bottle look like? Orange. So that means we keep thinking that the bottle is changing colors. What is happening in reality? It's a reflection. The, the objects have colors. The bottle is what? Cleared. But perceptually, whatever is the characteristic of this cup begins to be what? Imputed to the bottle. Exactly the same thing with reference to thoughts and awareness. Awareness, clear. One thought comes and you think what? The awareness I has taken that form. That thought goes, next thought comes. You think your I, which is always clear, becomes that. So this is how we keep making mistakes. Whatever the nature of thought is, gets imputed to what? I am. In fact, in order for you to figure out, imagine that the, uh, it was programmed in a way that you will see first the orange, then the pink, then the yellow, then the other uh, uh, shade of orange. It was constantly moving and you have to figure out that this bottle is free from all colors. How would you do it without stopping the flow of objects? How would you figure it out? Tell me. To know it. But how would you? Which logic will you use to know it? To separate. Uh, how would you separate? <laughs> Excellent. You use your intellect to say, Hey, if the glass was pink, it should always remain pink. But the pinkness comes and goes. Then the glass appears orange. If orange was its real color, it will be stuck to it. But orange also comes and goes. So therefore, the glass is neither orange nor pink. It is free from being both. The proximity gives that what? Appearance. Do you get it? You don't need to change the physically stop it. The relationship between awareness and mind, you can't stop. The thoughts keep coming and going, you can't stop it. But through logic, you can come to know that if each one comes and goes and doesn't stick to it, it's already free from it. 
because if it was all if as she says if we did for if it was both pink and orange you should always see both pink and orange because that is the nature but if the pink completely disappears and the orange also completely disappears and yellow also completely disappears none of it is sticking to it do you understand why it can't be all otherwise this glass bottle should always appear what everything that it all is all it should appear pink orange yellow all at the same time always if that was the intrinsic nature once you understand this logic you free your awareness from any thought and any condition of the body and the wise person have figured it out so therefore uh, they know a little bit more about what is the nature of atma it is not only awareness because of which what uh, the different thoughts and different conditions of the body and the world are known it is more than that the wise people know even more than that and what is that i will tell you tomorrow mm -hmm. so you you're saying that it's not just the intellect intellectual portion of it but the direct experience of it so in the fact, wise person it is also. one awareness without which in fact no experiences are possible we are not talking about experiencing atma specially it is that which is behind in and through every experience but because of ignorance uh, uh, the ignorance uh, there are two things one is atma awareness which is always present the other one is coming and going thought yeah. and the nature of mistake that we make is whatever the thought is we impute that to i but when you are referring to a wise person who has mm -hmm. figured it out yes. you mean intellectually figured it out or knows more the knows more, knows more. and then yeah. means knows more okay yeah so in in fact everything understanding is only uh, in the sense that it is intellectual without your buddhi you can't understand right but it is not only the it, the the, the understanding the has got it percolated in the being of the person that yes. i tell you okay tomorrow okay. we talked about the uh, illness causing suffering okay. you have pain yes in your back so yes yes okay there is suffering yes what or who is experiencing the suffering yeah so if it's is, not me yeah see this is what i say that there is a sensation of suffering right there is a sensation there is a physical sensation yes. then there is a corresponding emotion there is a center of the mind which creates the emotion I, there is this i sense which says i am suffering I'm connected to the suffering exactly connected to and this is all perfect it's true it's biological it is biological biology. it's true it is true but what we miss out is there is one awareness which is in whose presence all these things take place but we can avoid so, the suffering no at the level of the mind it is true but mm -hmm. whether see it is like you are clear whether the bottle is pink or this is pink is the bottle pink then there is a problem because if you are suffering then in fact the whole life that suffering should remain but when the body gets well that feeling of suffering also goes that means it is not your intrinsic nature for the time being that is what the thought of the mind the problem that we have is our self identity gets totally mixed with whatever thought is existing at that given point in time that is the nature of problem that we are not talking that there is no thought but that the non discrimination between the locus where it is happening is the problem okay and why 
when the locus is uh, outside from the atma yes it's still there okay it's there wonderful it's still there but when you have this little perspective then what happens is a load and the burden of it gets less okay. and secondly uh, the whole of uh, this yoga shastra of bhagavad gita it talks about how to now cultivate the mind where it doesn't just remain some kind of a very uh, removed intellectual inquiry it becomes your being so there is a lot of practices lot of frameworks given to even uh, empirically reduce the suffering so that we will see the whole of bhagavad gita it's about uh, kind of dissociation between the uh, the i and the see mind first, and, and uh, body. excellent so it has wonderful so that means there is a real uh, distinction between body mind and atma which we generally don't have normally people don't have so now not perceptually no, exactly is perceptually is not possible that's why i said okay. if it was programmed like this you will always be fooled because you can't stop the program the only thing you can do is through inquiry to inquiry you can say if it was pink it should always be pink if it was orange it should always be orange the very fact that all these colors come and go intrinsically it cannot be any right but then a lot of uh, bhagavad gita also talks about how to prepare the mind in a way that this real this becomes a reality not just a far removed not concept. a pale uh, construction not a pale of concept. the mind exactly yes exactly can i add something yeah there is you are right the first step of this inquiry mm -hmm. starts by there is a distinction between i atma and the rest so what you thought was I now is negated as being non-I. Mm -hmm. So this is the first step. So it seems, and I am not anticipating, but I am just elaborating a bit on what you are saying, it seems that there are two things now. There is all what is not I and what is okay. I. Then the second step of the inquiry will resolve that question now. Okay. I am not saying more than that. Okay, it's not dualistic. Exactly, you got it. Okay. So that you have to wait. Have to she wait. will speak about okay. that. <laughs> Good. I'm very happy you have questions because that means you are thinking. <laughs> very good. If anybody has any other questions, if not today, what I really would like to do is can we have about 15-20 minutes of meditation at least? Maybe we can do it if people have a date or if they want, if they want to leave, they can do now. And the people who want to stay, and so we are as ready for it, and we would appreciate it if you are not doing communication. What we are trying to do is, whatever we learned now, he will do a meditation. He will make you think about what we learned in his own simple words, which I think is highly effective. Mm. Because here you are using your kind of, you know, the, the uh, intellect to understand that you will relax. So now we say yeah, just maybe Surya twenty because I was supposed to stop at eight thirty, but it is almost nine. Okay. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnan Purnamudachate. Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti Shanti